How do you feel great on vacation? Like really good? Easy. You go to Aruba. You'll spend your time relaxing on cool white sand beaches and floating in healing blue water. You'll immerse yourself in natural wonder and find your center on an island where things move at your speed. You won't just feel great. You'll feel relaxed, renewed, and ready for life. That's the Aruba effect. Plan your trip at aruba.com. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom-heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. All right, real quick before we get started on the show, I'm just going to talk about Treeline Academy. You've heard me say it. I can't even tell you how many times. Um, Mark Livesey is treelineacademy.net. That's treelineacademy.net. Sign up. Use the promo code PC2020. Save yourself 20 bucks. Can't say it enough. It's awesome. Amazing. Most comprehensive e-scouting course out there. Check it out for yourself. Sign up. Use promo code PC2020. And now let's get to the show. All right. So I'm sitting here and I'm talking to Tim Clemens and... Tim, I'm going to let you take it away and introduce yourself. Okay, great. Thanks for having me here, Luke. Uh, my name is Tim Clemens. I'm the founder and owner of Ironwood Foraging Company in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm a professional full-time forager. So with that professional full-time foraging, how long do you feel that it took you to where you were comfortable enough to even speculate that you could do that? Well, I think I always had the the seed in me uh, that I wanted to do it professionally. And so I hit the books extremely hard. Every day I was out in the field, all seasons, just looking at everything I could, just cast it a wide net. Um, I think by the second year, I realized it was something that really charged me up and that I couldn't get anywhere else. And that's when, you know, it was like, this can be a business. This has to be something that other people know. I can't believe other people don't know this. And now um, it's been about eight or nine years, I think. Time is a construct. <laughs> so yeah, it's been about eight or nine years. So you could say that I have like a PhD in it now. If that was college, <laughs> I'd have a PhD. I Or really lazy <laughs> masters. <laughs> I know that your meme game is pretty strong on the old social. And um, I'm going to say... 60% of your memes, I know what the heck you're talking about. The rest of it, sometimes it goes right over my head. But um, I'm guessing you kind of really pour yourself into whatever whatever you get into and kind of go with it as far as the studies. So um, that's it's pretty neat. So how long before you decided to go full time on the foraging thing? Well, I'd say probably four years in. I decided to give myself a plan. I set up a five-year plan and said, you have to do everything possible to learn everything you can before those five years are up because then you're going full-time. And, you know, I knew I was going to be taking, you know, the forager kind of takes their own life in their hands because you rest upon your own knowledge instead of like a complex, you know, grocery store logistical system. You're, there's nothing standing between you and what you're consuming. So it has to be your knowledge. And I realized that if I was teaching people, then their safety also rested in my hands. So I took that super seriously. And um, yeah, so it probably took me four years to realize I needed a five-year plan, and then I made it. And that started last year um, on April 4th was the end of my five-year plan, and it worked out perfectly. Right into the lockdowns, huh? (laughs) Right in, yeah. People really wanted to... I've never seen more people 
um, in the public parks than I did this year. I mean, to say it was probably a 20 or 50 fold increase, um, I don't think is hyperbole. There was a ton of people out there. Wow. That's, that's crazy. Um, so what was, what was the first thing that you foraged or found on your own that you were confident enough to eat? Hmm. Good question. I had two false starts getting into foraging. So once when I was seven or roughly there, I ate gooseberry. I didn't know what it was. It just, my brain, my child brain was like, you gotta eat that. And so I ate it not knowing what it was and it turned out fine. It was great. What was it? Forgot what it was. Can you? Uh, gooseberry. Okay. Gooseberry. Um, so you yep. ate, you ate a gooseberry and so are gooseberries poisonous? So gooseberries are not poisonous. Um, when you eat them green, they're extremely tart. Okay. And so I really like that. And then that was a false start. I didn't get into foraging after, you know, at the age of seven. <laughs> okay. I think I was 18, like 17 to 18. And I was on a jog and I came across, it was August. And I ran next to a tree that had big orange fruit on it and just covered in it. And I pulled one of them down. It seemed all right. <laughs> like I was not applying any of the safety measures that a forager needs to. But again, I ate this fruit. I re- I looked at it and I said, persimmon? oh, it has. <laughs> was it a persimmon? So this wasn't. No, this was a, an American wild plum. Okay. Yeah, Prunus Americana. So. <laughs> and so I had one big seed. And that told me stone fruit. So I thought I was fine. And then I had to look it up afterwards, which is not what you should do. <laughs> Why is it that any of the foragers that I talk to, though, or anybody that's fairly successful and, and actually does it for a full time or something like that, they all have stories like that where they just had that instinct and they wanted, you know what, I'm going to eat that. And then afterwards, they start questioning themselves. But at the moment, they were <laughs> like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. It's, it's kind of interesting that that yeah, all happens. Yeah, it's funny, like the... Yeah, I don't have a poisoning story, but Sam Fair, he, Samuel Fair is one of the foremost, if not the foremost, foraging author, um, especially for our region, upper Midwest. Um, he has two poisoning stories where he didn't actually poison himself, but he thought so much ab- about the fact that he may have poisoned himself that he psychosomatically poisoned himself. <laughs> so he started hyperventilating, lost feeling in his arms, like... He was like, oh, no, now now it's reinforcing that he poisoned himself. And so he, he like, I think he went into the hospital, I'm not sure. Or he just wrote it out. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so, yeah, those stories are common. That's. I was talking to another guy that same thing, same scenario. He was talking, he was actually telling me that there was, uh, they were all sitting around, a bunch of foragers were sitting around a campfire one night and Sam Thayer was there and uh, a couple other people and it was all telling stories about stuff that they ate and thought maybe they poisoned themselves. And they're like, Oh, this is it. Why did I do that? (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty good. I don't have any of those stories. I'm still in the skepticism phase, I would say. But, um, what would you say to somebody that, that is kind of still in that skepticism phase? Like, how do you overcome that? I, I don't know why, but like I can identify something. I can see it in the book and go, okay, and then there's still just that little bit of embedded fear because we've gotten so distant, it seems, from from those ancestral roots that, that you know, yes, this is good. You can eat this, this you can't. That now, unless it comes from a store out of packaging or something like that, or you grew it yourself in your garden, that nobody wants to eat it. How do you overcome that? Well, that feeling of skepticism, I would say trust it. A lot of people try to get rid of it far too soon and they can get themselves into trouble. It just so happens that there's a lot of things that aren't poisonous out there. So your chances of seriously poisoning yourself are low, um, but the risks can be death depending on what you're foraging for, especially for mushroom plants. So listen to the skepticism. Uh, me personally, I remember how like I was just blown away that I could eat things outside, but I was fearful of them. I would find, for instance, a a mushroom or a fruit probably three times and identify it um, confidently each time, but I still wouldn't eat it. So after the third time, I would be, I would taste a little bit, see how that went. 
Um, but yeah, mostly just listen to that feeling because people don't listen to that enough, actually. Uh, there is a point where it turns skepticism turns into phobia and you just got to make sure it doesn't go there. And okay. consulting with an expert is the best way to, you know, bridge that gap. So where do you find said expert? Where would somebody go about finding that expert? Um, let's see. I mean, do a Google search for your area because um, region specific experts are what you want. Um, like if someone wants to forage in Minnesota, maybe they have a trip planned here or like northern Wisconsin or something similar. Um, I would be able to tell them things. But if someone's in Florida or Missouri or California, I'm out of my depth and I wouldn't be able to answer their questions except in a very general way. So typically a Google search with, um, you know, maybe the closest large city or just your state can help you narrow things down. Um, if you're looking for mushrooms specifically, you can look for, you know, I'm also the president of the Minnesota Mycological Society. So mycological or mycology is the study of mushrooms or fungi in general. So, you know, throw that in to Google or mushroom club or even go to the closest university and inquire in their biology department if they have, um, you know, any foragers or uh, a mushroom club or something like that. Facebook is a really good way too. There's yep. a lot of groups on Facebook. It's probably the only thing Facebook is good for anymore. <laughs> um, unless you like getting angry <laughs> and fighting with people, uh, decent <laughs> people. Yeah. So foraging groups on Facebook. Amazing. Instagram, fantastic community for it. I've kind of noticed that. That's, I mean, it's pretty much like the only thing that keeps me, well, other than the podcast, obviously, on social media is just the experiences, relationships, the the connections that you make with people of, you know, the same type of interest and stuff. I, I find that really fascinating. Try that's to stay away from media. all the politics <laughs> and every all the other garbage because truly that's what it is. Um, but yep. yeah, I, I agree. Um, so like I've noticed I've went on like eat the weeds .com or something like that before, but it seems like it's kind of outdated. Like, yeah, mean green Dean, um, green Dean. He has a lot of good stuff to say. Um, he, he's kind of a, he's an enthusiastic person <laughs> and, <laughs> um, yeah, some of it's a little bit outdated. Yeah. Um, if you go into foraging groups online, he kind of has a polarizing effect on certain people. <laughs> um, but he's, he is super knowledgeable. And his website, Eat the Weeds, was definitely something I looked at all the time when I just got into foraging. I would yeah. always leave that website wondering, like, first of all, how does he know all this? Because he brings in history. It's, like, very anthropological as well, okay. which I value. Um, but I would always be like, wow, I came here looking for one thing, and I left with, like, 20. <laughs> That's so, pretty cool. <laughs> so yeah. um, when when you were talking about how you went out and you started identifying things and stuff like that, you always had the guides in your hand and manuals and stuff. And I know you mentioned Sam Thayer, and I, I've mentioned it on quite a few podcasts and stuff, and that's pretty much what I use. But was there other resources that you used as well? Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, the people I took classes with, starting out or probably who I really have to give the biggest thanks for because you know pl how you plant a seed or how you start uh, a sapling is probably the most important thing that decides you know that being's trajectory um, and their growth and their ability to grow effectively you know in the long run and so I learned a lot from my Ojibwe language professor at the University of Minnesota his name's Dennis Jones and I have Ojibwe heritage on my father's side, so it really helped make it something that I could connect to on a deeper level. It wasn't just about, like, where can I get my, a free meal? That wasn't bad, because I was in college at the time, so free food was my motivating factor in life. <laughs> <laughs> but when you connect it to, you know, concepts of deep time, ancestry, um, you know, just stewardship of the land in general, you know, Foraging be can become a magic to you and something that um, allows you to, you know, kind of experience transcendence, which I think our lives lack a lot these days. I mean, nature is the, this transcendent area. So, 
you know, sitting in the uh, Eskiga Mizaganing, which is Ojibwe for boiling sap place. So basically the sugar bush where you make maple syrup. Um, and just learning about how important um, that activity was to my ancestors and people now. Uh, just, you know, it, it, it made the roots go deeper of foraging. So good people are necessary. Um, yeah, this, like, like we said, social media, books in general. There's a really good website called fallingfruit.org. I'm not sure if you've, I've you've never heard one. of that. What's, what's that all about? Yeah. Falling fruit is, uh, it's just like, it's like Google maps, but overlaid over the map is like all the edible food on the landscape. So it's like um, a KTML file or something like that, that somebody created that you can add to the Google maps or something. Or yeah. Um, okay. basically you, uh, can just drop a pin anywhere and you can say, uh, I think it got big with a dumpster diving community at first. Okay. Like, they wanted it to be for like foraging plants and like to some level of gleaning. So like someone has extra apples on their tree and they want to give it away. They just throw a pin on their house. They take a picture of the tree, have a little blurb on it saying like, I have too many apples. Come take them. Ring my doorbell first. You can have them. Um, then the dumpster diving community got on there. And so it'd be like, you know, Trader Joe's wait till 11:45 like you know <laughs> on a tuesday you'll get the good stuff i mean so it was like that but then um in minneapolis somebody added the entire city's forestry department's uh, tree inventory so all the boulevard trees and all the park trees got put on there and so it's super cool you can um i actually found a lot early on i found a lot of trees that i didn't even know were edible um on there and i was like oh those are edible throw that into google wow like has a ton of edible uses like russian olive or um you know tamarack trees or black walnuts i mean you can highlight one thing and they'll show you in minneapolis where it is helps with id too because uh if you don't know what a i don't know autumn olive tree looks like or siberian elm or yeah. siberian elm or a swamp yeah. white oak then you just drive up you can actually drive up and be like oh so that's one of you guys and learn all <laughs> that, about it. that is super helpful what's that called again uh, it's called fallingfruit.org and it only works on desktop the mobile app um, just isn't quite there yet that's interesting so my property is littered absolutely littered with black walnuts and oh. i've talked to people before i just i can't bring myself to take the time. To, I, I don't know. I can't to crack them all and try and hand pick the meat out. And Ooh, yeah, I they do know. take time for sure. Um, have you ever tried it and it was just too ridiculous or no, I've, well, I've tried like a handful of them and then it's like, okay. you get the tannins all over you and didn't wear gloves and you know, big mess, oh, big you know rookie what? mistake. I think my, um, my only like fun foraging foible story is uh, two weeks before my wedding. <laughs> it was black walnut season. <laughs> I processed probably a bushel of black walnuts. And were probably eight shades darker than the rest of me. Your, your so hands? We had, yeah, my hands. We had pictures coming up. I was just furiously washing it. Like, I was washing my hands with everything I could think of like my life depended on it because it did. and. Uh, just just in time i got my hands clean but <laughs> yeah those will stain everything the only thing that i've learned that stains more than black walnuts is that por15 the paint that like locks in rust for like a, a vehicle like for a, you painting okay. truck frames and stuff i got that stuff on me and i tried to google any kind of remedy that would work or anything and every single person said the same thing and it was time Time and dead skin is the only thing that will take it off. And that was no BS. It was like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. And you go and like move your arm and your sleeve comes up and it's all over. And I actually wore something that, you know, like a it soaked through the Tyvek. So <laughs> and got all oh, over wow. my arms. Yeah. Should have wore long sleeves underneath it, I guess. But whatever. You live yeah, and you, you live and you learn. Yeah, then you want to have a cool story. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so um you like what kind of books did you use then? Like Sam Thayer books? Did you use like a Gary Linkoff book? What all of the above? What was your uh, go-to references there? 
Yeah, I actually got a bunch of them around me right now. But I'd say if you want your first book and you live in the Midwest um, or even the Eastern United States, Sam Thayer's books. So The Forager's Harvest, get that one. Uh, his second one is Nature's Garden. And his third one is Incredible Wild Edibles. The first book actually comes with its own DVD if you get it from their website. And it's just like this insane masterclass that's just on a DVD so you can pause it, rewind. I mean, it's like <laughs> probably the most valuable thing ever. And like nobody knows about it. It's I sad to say it. I have it. And I've yet oh, to yeah? watch. I've yet to watch it. I've got three little oh, kids. You've got to watch it. I've got three little kids, yeah. so normally the TV is dominated by bubble guppies or whatever. Okay. So <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah, you gotta sneak off. You gotta like find some time to just sneak off and watch Sam Thayer uh, yeah. teach you about how to eat everything. <laughs> I'll have to do that for sure. Um, so I recently just got a new cookbook, and I'm pretty sure it was something that you posted. And I was like, Oh, I've heard of him before. I've heard him talking. And I ended up ordering it, flipping through it today. Um, just came today actually, but it's the, the Sioux chef and like Sioux nation chef, uh, indigenous people's cookbook. So it was, was that you that, I mean, are, yeah, it was. you have a restaurant background too, right? Like yes, but front of the house. Oh, so okay. Front of the house. Okay. Intimately knowledgeable of the food, but just really getting into cooking. I actually, um, I learned how to forage first and the cooking is coming second. So it's been interesting. And if you are a forager that's trying to get into cooking for the first time, um, or just you're like, how do I use these ingredients now that I have them and I identify them and they're cool. Uh, the sous chef indigenous kitchen is probably like the number one thing that you should get. Um, yeah. I was, I was kind of looking through it and I'm like, well, this is kind of like some of the stuff I make now, but with, more native things and stuff like that um yeah people notice the lack of salt and they notice the lack of um beef and chicken uh there's no wheat or, of any kind there's no uh, dairy of any kind because it's all supposed to be you know pre-contact so pre-1492 um foods that would have been here in north america including mexico but didn't i mean Technically, corn is grass, right? I mean, yep. didn't the indig actually grow some types of grain or harvest? I mean, they harvested, obviously, like up by you, they harvested wild rice like crazy. But, I mean, they still they still grew and had some agriculture, right? Definitely. Um, the eastern United States, actually, so in Illinois, uh, you've been to Cahokia, I bet. That's with all the mounds, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, long time Honestly, ago. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> one of the most fascinating places on the planet, and most Americans don't know it exists. It's actually getting a little bit more popular. Um, I've started to see certain science publications posting about it. Um, you know, like Pop Science, like Bill Nye and stuff. They'll they'll mention it. Um, Cahokia was one of only ten or eleven places on the planet where agriculture was independently invented. So. Cahokia was this large metropolis, had about 40,000 people. It was larger than Rome and London um, at the same time that it existed. Um, yeah, and they grew about eight different plants. So they had massive agricultural fields. Um, corn became you know, one of those plants later on, but they actually started with a, a lot of plants that we can you know, kind of still find today, but they're kind of difficult to find. Um, we do regard them as like agricultural pests or weeds. So let's see, we got Kinopodium. Uh, I think it's Berlandarii. That's like related to quinoa. Okay. That was a big thing over here. Giant ragweed was another one. Um, so what would they use the ragweed for? I mean, like the seed or? The seeds are okay. very oily. And um, they all had, they had domestic cultivars at the time. So you can actually find it in the fossil record. Uh, not the fossil record, the, the archaeological record. And you can see the seeds get bigger over time. So you can see, like, maybe um, a, a seed changes its morphology, like, you know, over a period of 500 years. Like, at this point, it loses its testa, which is, like, this sheath that in, can inhibit germination or make germination slower. And so you can see that it actually get bred out over time. So really cool agricultural things going on. It's called the Eastern Agricultural Complex. and most people don't know about it. 
Interesting. Um, we always think about Mesopotamia being the birthplace of agriculture, but you know, Illinois and the Ohio River Valley, um, these are all places that agriculture was invented here. So it's super fascinating. And you can still find those plants today. That is pretty cool. Yeah. Going to have to check that out now and maybe pay another visit that I'll actually remember it. Um, yeah, that's definitely cool. So what kind of, um, like what kind of plants are you currently searching for like this time of year, you know, late winter? Oh, good question. Um, Minnesota's pretty, you know, inhospitable. I mean, you know, it's not too much different, but for some reason in Minnesota, we get this, uh, whenever you see like a cold front map of the entire country, it goes yeah. like <laughs> Canada, can't like, the coldest is like Canada, Canada, Canada. And then right when it gets to Minnesota, it dips down. It's like, and you guys in particular, and then goes back up to like Canada being cold. Yeah. So we get like these random negative 60 degree, like week periods every winter. It's ridiculous, but we do still have stuff to forage. People think there isn't. Um, some good things are high bush cranberries. They're really good. Are those um, like most of those are definitely froze by now though. Right? Like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, they're definitely frozen, maybe shriveled. And then that gets into like the foraging um, mindset of just because it's not pretty doesn't mean it's not delicious. And that's, you know, that's a big thing to take into foraging too. People want produce section, beautiful foods. Um, Super they they... genetically modified, <laughs> yeah. polished with wax in somebody's barn or wherever. I, don't, I still don't, I can't, I have to peel an apple. <laughs> like if we're, we're going to talk right. about that. If I'm, I, 90% of the time I don't eat the skin because it's garbage. It's polished with wax. It's horrible. Why would somebody do that? I just don't get it. <laughs> right. Probably. Do, I mean, almost certainly still has residue. I mean, even if it's organic, they're yeah. definitely allowed to spray things onto the plants that you would not consider to be organic if you knew about them. But there's big money in making sure people don't know about them. Um, but there's a whole list. There's like 80 different chemicals that, you know, an organic farm can use. Right. Um, and that wax or that vegetable wax on the, the coating of the apple really serves to keep that on. So even if you think you're washing it, like giving it a quick rinse in the sink, which is more than most people do, <laughs> uh, you're still not getting through that wax and you're definitely eating a residue. I don't worry about it too much, but it's definitely there. It imparts the taste, though. Like I taste it different than if you went and I pick an, an apple from the tree in my yard, which I recently discovered were all clones from the original. Blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind what? that it wasn't a Pippin. It was actually a clone. It was a graft. <laughs> and that, I couldn't believe that. It, it, my whole life, I'm like, oh yeah, apple trees, you could probably take a seed, plant it. Absolutely not. It doesn't work like yeah, that. Yeah, they don't breed true. Yeah. And, so, <laughs> uh, have, you, have you ever considered like grafting some pears onto there? Cause you can graft pears onto an apple tree. I have not. I do have pear trees. Um, there you go. but, uh, yeah, th they're not good producers though. I got to say they are not good producers. I need to find a different variety or something, but, um, Bummer. yeah, we have a ornamental up here that is popular, um, as a boulevard tree and it's an ornamental pear. I don't know what cultivar or anything like that, but, uh, Every three years, you just get more pears than you could, you know, throw at people. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to the high bush cranberries. I'm sorry. I totally sidetracked you there and started talking about the no, apples. That's perfect. But um, so the high bush cranberries, people don't like them because they, they don't necessarily look good um, and don't want to eat them along with a lot of other things. And you're saying keep that mindset. Is there like other things that you could go into a little bit more? in detail about like, Hey, this doesn't always look good at all, but it would still taste good. Yeah. I think, uh, another one is, uh, that I harvest this time of year, um, that fits that perfectly is the crab apple. I mean, just the name crab apple. People are like, that's not something you eat. Some people think they're poisonous. I mean, um, and you know, when they look the best, which, you know, is in like late summer, fall, maybe they're beautiful. That's not the time to eat them. That's actually when they're the worst. The time to eat them is now in winter when they're still on the tree. They're wrinkly. They might look mushy. Um, in fact, when you squeeze them, they turn to mush. 
this is the best time to eat them because now they're these tart little packets of sweet applesauce. So are um, you just, just ready made for you? So you're just literally taking them, squeezing them in your mouth, and and uh, going that way. Okay, not like oh, yeah. taking them and making applesauce. And and is it true? I gotta ask this. That's the only native apple species to the United States, right? Yeah, there's about four. There's about four native apple species, and I believe they're all crab apples. That's interesting. So the other ones came from Europe or brought over from other regions? Yeah, originally Asia. So they're actually not, I don't think they're native. There might be some species that are native to Europe, but I think Asia is actually where um, apples came from originally, and then they traveled to Europe, so kind of jumped around. Very there was there were there were Johnny Apple seeds elsewhere. I can guarantee. You. <laughs> yeah, I always find that fascinating. The dude goes around taking apple seeds, has no idea what they're going to taste like or anything. Grows these little pippins and starts selling them to people. And like, here you go. <laughs> but I guess I mean it makes sense, right? Because obviously you need that food source. You're going to take those seeds from those apples and plant more trees, just so you can have your own local orchard and do things with it but yeah that's a chaotic good alignment uh if, if anybody plays dungeons and dragons that's chaotic good if i ever heard of heard of someone being that i do not know D D, but i'll take your word for it on that one <laughs> yeah i mean he's doing good but he's a chaotic spirit he's just like yeah let's see what happens <laughs> so um let's kind of talk about so is there stuff that you can go and identify now easily that when you go back later in the year, you can kind of, uh, okay, that's something very similar or, you know what I mean? Like they, the different stages of growth look similar throughout that makes it easy to where like now without a lot of other vegetation around would, would really a walk through the woods would be easy you to like go look at it and be like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a great plant to, I see it now. Cause there's not all the other, you know, stuff around growing. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say, some things that are really easy to find right now are anything that puts up a, a stock, anything that's like, you know, about three feet tall, especially prairie plants. Um, one thing, one plant I have in mind in particular is wild bergamot. Um, do you know that one? I do not. I mean, I've heard of it. I've seen it in books, but I've never put two and two together yet as far as actual picture to plant. Yeah. It's, it's, um, pretty identifiable right now because it sends up this thin you know single stem about three feet tall maybe a little bit taller and at the end it has um it's empty what was its seed and flower head so it just looks like a bunch of little tubes all connected because it's a composite flower head so it looks like one flower but it's actually a hundred flowers working together to you know attract pollinators um by looking like one flower okay and um when it's individual flowers fall out and the seeds are all gone. It just leaves all these little tubes in this like dome shaped um, flower head. And what's cool about wild bergamot in particular is if you go up to that and you're like, I'm pretty sure that this is, you know, the, the seed head, the spent seed head of this bergamot plant. But how can I be sure you can actually grab the seed head and crush it up under your nose and you'll smell that just, you know, you, you can't mistake the smell of bergamot like Earl Grey tea. And it keeps that all winter. And so then, you know, to just go at the base of that stalk um, in the springtime, and then you can follow the plant from, you know, seedling to maturity. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Is there any more that you can think of off the top of your head that would be like that? I'd say probably the easiest tree to identify right now is uh, the Kentucky coffee tree. Rare. That's a rare tree. Pretty rare. Yeah. I know it's a, guy. A, it's a holdover from when mammoths and giant sloths used to yeah. roam the land. They're the ones that spread its seeds and nothing does anymore except I for actually, people and water. I knew that. <laughs> I knew that. I could say I actually knew that. So, yeah. Uh, the, so now you actually have to, because their digestive system was what actually broke out the outer layer, right? And so that way it would propagate. Yeah, the seed so would actually hard. propagate. Yeah. I know a guy that has a bunch of those on his property. And oh, cool. a couple of different universities had to come, well, came, got permission, came and collected the seeds for their vaults so they could have uh, those seeds in their seed vault. So that's pretty cool. So that's yeah, how super I know identifiable about that. right now because they have these uh, 
thick pods that just are the only thing on the tree right now. So they kind of stop you. You're like, what? What is that? And there's nothing really that looks like them um, if you're paying attention to the details. So, so let's let's go into that then. The Kentucky coffee tree and the beans on the pod. Uh, technically not beans, but seeds. Um, so what are you doing with them? Yeah, what I do with those, um, and disclaimer on this one is I only know one other person that does this, and uh, it's Alan Berger. <laughs> so okay. we're both we both have experience with this. Um, we both haven't been hurt by it. We're both reasonably sure it's safe. Um, but I'm definitely not going to like tell everybody to go eat these without using your own caution. So just disclaimer. Um, but what I use them for, well, first let's get to what everybody uses them for. And that was how it's got, how it got its name, the Kentucky coffee tree. So you take the, um, the mature seeds out of the pod. The pod has turned brown. You open it up. It's gooey and green. And you'll see, you know, anywhere from probably one to five or six marble-sized, very hard uh, brown seeds. And what you do with those is you gather up a bunch, um, enough to fill like a, a baking um, pan, and then you roast them um, for like four hours. Something ridiculous, just so they like they'll explode. It'll sound like gunshots in your oven, um, and then you're left with this like charred mess that was used as a coffee extender. So much like chicory was used um, in Louisiana. Um, it's not really like coffee. It's more like a. It makes a dark tea. It doesn't have any caffeine in it or anything like that. It's just used to bulk up your coffee that was hard to get. Um, so, when the area was the frontier. So it's kind of like the pencil shavings that a lot of people drink. I'm not naming any name brands or anything like that out there, <laughs> but we know some of them may have toasted barley or some other things in them. That's all I'm going to say with that because I, I roast my own coffee. So I'm kind of a coffee snob. <laughs> and oh, cool. so that's actually, so when you're actually roasting coffee, it's first crack, second crack, you know, all that good stuff. But, um, yeah, so I like roasting my own coffee. I'm a snob. I would never try and use a Kentucky coffee bean to try and extend my roast. I like that full flavor. I like different notes in my coffee, and I like it to be strong. <laughs> so never going to happen. What? So what do you use it for then, the Kentucky coffee bean? Yeah, so uh, also, by the way, I am trying to become – I'm like a, a baby coffee snob. I'm trying to get into oh. it more. Uh, actually – uh, the, the quarantines took away my, my, uh, outlet for that. We had a really cool coffee shop here in Minneapolis called botany coffee, just a small little place, but they did everything really well. And then they had to close down. So I don't have like my Ethiopian or my Guatemalan coffees anymore. Oh dude, uh, you could totally get all that still. You just got to roast yeah. it on your own. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of, uh, you know what? I probably will get into that. Um, hopefully my wife doesn't hear this. <laughs> <laughs> I already do so much stuff. Um, but yeah, what I use the Kentucky coffee seeds for and why I actually kind of changed the name of the tree, the, I just call it the coffee nut tree instead of the Kentucky coffee tree. Uh, mostly because out of state pride, uh, we're in Minnesota. So, <laughs> you know, giving Kentucky credit for the trees here doesn't make sense. So I call it the coffee nut tree. And why nut makes sense is those seeds can be um, nuts, basically. And so instead of roasting them into, what would you call it, an Italian roast? What's the darkest roast of coffee? Well, you get into like a Vienna roast or a French roast would be your darkest. I believe Vienna is the darkest, which is technically burnt. It's almost ash. Yeah. It's almost ash. But oh, that so, makes sense. so what do you, so yeah, instead of doing that, I do like a, a blonde, uh, roast of these, of these nuts and, um, you kind of have to do it by feel. I have no numbers for people to follow if they want to do it, but, um, you, you know, set it to two fifty or so. And then those nuts, you wait like about 40 minutes and you start cracking them open with a nutcracker one at a time at about the 45 minute mark. And when you crack them open, initially they will be yellowish white in color and they'll smell like green bell peppers. Interesting. And that's, yeah, pretty interesting. Very green, 
um, scented. Uh, they also taste green and they'll kind of dry your mouth out and they're arguably poisonous at that stage. <laughs> so okay. um, at 45 minutes, you'll probably crack it open and it will look decidedly more yellow. Um, that means you got to keep going. What you want is kind of like a, a blonde, like a, um, are, is the light version of a brownie called a blondie? Yes, it is. Yeah. So if you compare the color to a blondie, that's pretty much what you want. Maybe even a little bit darker, but not too much. You definitely don't want to go like brown. Okay. A deep tan would be nice. Then you can eat them at that point and they're delicious. They're I'd have to say they probably like peanut butter, but they're not really. I mean, that's just the closest analog. That's interesting. So, so what is it that you're cooking out of them that possibly could be somewhat toxic or something? Um, the the green. I mean, is it like a level of arsenic or something that's like a that? Really good question. Like it's apple seeds. Some or? alkaloid. Okay. It's just, yeah because uh, yeah I know it's an alkaloid of some sort, um, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. And I'm not sure if it's if it's known what it is so because i mean even if you have like a full chemical inventory of what's in there um you'll find a lot in foraging if you get into like the food chemistry of mushrooms or certain wild plants that even if you name every chemical in there there's a lot of chemicals in there that we we actually don't know anything about a lot of right. mushroom proteins are just named like protein x995 you know things <laughs> like that because they don't know what the <laughs> compounds are yet that's yeah not at yeah. all totally novel that's pretty amazing. But, um, so like, an, what is it? An oxalic, uh, calcification or something like that. Like there's crystals or something that when you touch it to your tongue, I've, I've heard things like that. What, what is that about? Yeah. Um, oxalic acid. Um, okay. yeah, I think it's oxalates. Um, yeah, I wish I knew more of the chemistry. <laughs> it's like calcium oxalate, I think, is okay. like the, the neutral version. But yeah, um, oxalates um, can come in a form called raphides or raphides. I don't know how to pronounce a lot of words. I think the, what I tell people is if you're trying to pronounce Latin, um, just say it with confidence. And <laughs> Fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah, fake it till you make it. Um, <laughs> and also, if you mispronounce a word ever, it just means that you learned... Like you learned on your own or you learn by reading and people really respect that. So never feel shy about just like giving it the good old college try saying a random <laughs> word. So these raphides or raffides are little like stabby bits that um, get into your tissues and inflame them greatly. So yeah, if you eat a plant that has that like skunk cabbage, um, which is what Chicago is named after in Ojibwe. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you knew that. It's smelly onion. Yeah. Skunk cabbage. Yep. Yeah. And, so it's from Jagag in Ojibwe, and that's where you get Jagago or Chica Chicago. Um, yep. It means just the place of many skunk cabbages. And skunk cabbages are kind of this food that people think you can eat, and then people always try because they read some source that <laughs> claimed it was edible, and they just like end up like you know burning their mouth and then everything all the way from their mouth to wherever the skunk cabbage exits. Hopefully, it's just your mouth. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah. with. That being said, pokeweed, you hear a lot of mixed things about that. Is it actually edible or not? Well, I guess I shouldn't say yeah, edible definitely. because everything is edible, right? But whether or not it has any ill right. effects to you is a different story than whether or not it's edible. But um, so you hear a lot of mixed things. I actually, when I was initially going out and trying to find elderberry, and I'm like, oh, I wonder if that's it. Oh, wait, no, that's not it. What the heck is this? And you find it growing all over the place. So like leaves, stem, and then, of course, the berries, which probably don't taste good. I'm not going to say I know whether or not they taste good or not because they do not taste good. But <laughs> um, so is it edible? So, yeah, um, with caution, I would say um, it is a toxic plant, but... There are, we eat a lot of toxic things that we just make edible, either by specifically changing the chemical nature of the plant, typically by, or of the item, typically by cooking. Um, it renders a lot of plants safe, but a lot of them, you know, can't be made safe by cooking. So maybe people um, dry them 
or, you know, expose them to some sort of natural acid like vinegar. I mean, there's like all these things we do and we kind of take for granted. Um, I mean, like even raw kidney beans uh, can kill you if you eat them, but nobody goes down the bean aisle and is like, well, scared of the kidney beans, you know? We just right. know that we cook them. And who was eating a raw kidney bean, honestly? Um, or a truly so yeah, raw um, almond, <laughs> for that matter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. exactly. And, uh, yeah, so pokeweed or Phytolacca americana, they are edible with proper preparation, and you have to pick them at the right stage. Um, I've actually only eaten them once. They're not a big thing here in Minnesota. Um, and the one time I had them was in Michigan. And I had the spring greens, and they were uh, boiled, um, I believe, multiple times. Yep. Uh, I, but they were delicious. I'm here. I'm alive. Um, so how how do they prepare the greens then? Like uh, how? Yeah. So I believe yeah we just went out and picked them and then um, boiled them in I think two changes of water. So you start from cold water each time, put the leaves in. Boil it for bringing it to a boil, boil it for 10 minutes, and then pour that water out um, and start that process over again. And yeah, they were good. I do hear that you can eat the berries. Um, you just can't eat the seeds. And so that's a mistake people make when they do get poisoned by it. These are more Appalachian traditions that I'm not the best person to ask about, but I did find a pokeweed plant, actually, two of them growing in my yard in our new house. So I'm nice. pretty excited to uh, experiment. I've got quite a bit growing around my property as well. Different cool. he hedgerows and stuff poking out of it. So I don't know. Maybe I'll play with it. My favorite Ho places. Hopefully I don't die. <laughs> um, <laughs> but speaking speaking of that then, like in talking about changes of water, you always hear like milkweed. You need to change the water, you know, three, four times is that really true? Do you really have to do that? Or is it one of those things that somehow somebody mistakenly maybe uh, took dog bane instead and did that and had ill effects? And that's why they now tell you to change the water. I don't know. I've, I've heard things like that to where maybe you don't have to change the water as much. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think you, in my experience, you don't have to change the water. Um, I can absolutely believe someone mixing it up with dog bane because they look so similar. It's really like if you're going on visual cues alone and you're kind of casually harvesting, I could see someone harvesting dog vein at the, you know, at the, the stage early stages, looks, right? Yeah. Look like milk bean. Yeah. Except, sure. except one's um, got like a pith and one's hollow though. So, right. Right. And then um, <laughs> one is a little bit furry and one's like totally smooth. Um, dog, and so dog vein is totally smooth. Its stem is. And a little then bit of red. Yep. If you're if you're talking about common milkweed, yep. um, Asclepias syriaca, uh, that has a little bit of like texture to its stem. It doesn't branch typically. Dogbane branches in maturity, so um, that's another good idea you've had uh, feature. Common milkweed has pink flowers, um, very distinctive flowers, and then dogbane has like greenish, subdued white, very small flowers that you almost won't notice. Um, so uh, it's bitter tasting and yes. common milkweed isn't. So would you taste the milkweed sap on its own? Yeah, you can do that. You're not, you're not going to get sick from it. Um, I, mean, I wouldn't drink like a, uh, a shot of it, but <laughs> you can definitely dab it on your tongue and you'll, you'll taste that it's has no taste or mild. And whereas the dog brain is going to be bitter. So. Um, so with that being said, then. So you just take your like your milkweed pods and fry them up or put them in a stir fryer or something like that without even doing any boiling or changes of water? Um, so I've had these prepared for me, and I only made one small one one time. Um, so I haven't gotten into the cooking. Like I'm kind of like I know the ingredients, and now it's time to revisit the ingredients and actually cook them for myself. Okay. Um, Alan, Alan Burgo actually has a really good – um, has multiple really good milkweed recipes on his website, uh, forager chef. So like, cause I've taken the pods and I've boiled them with just one change of water, but I'm still kind of wondering if it's possible that it, I don't even need to boil or blanch them in the water. Yeah. I think for best results, and this is just going off Alan's recipe. Um, and my half memory of it is blanching is 
important first to get the best results. Um, when I make it, I do plan on making it into a stir fry. So that's going to be happening this year. Because I was also thinking about like jalapeno popper type and even sliding Ooh. like jalapeno inside of the pod and then breading it and deep frying it. So I yeah. don't know, just experimenting. So then you get like the cheesiness that, that of the... It's supposed to be like a cheese. Yeah. Well, I mean, oh, yeah. let's be real. It does nothing taste quite like cheese, but it's... um. For sure. It's definitely got like a cheesiness, kind of like like a ground mustard seed with like some yeast has kind of the same taste as a cheese. I do love food. So, so um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like you could do a little bit of replication with like some some nutritional yeast and, and um, some ground that. ground mustard seed, but it's still not the same as cheese. But I feel that because I have an identical twin actually, and he has been like on and off again vegan for a few years here now and so i am trying like the nutritional yeast or i think he made like some some uh attempt at like i don't know tempeh or seitan whatever these like tofu alternatives are and he made like chicken wings but yeah it sounds terrible it sounds oh, absolutely it terrible i feel I, bad for vegans i really do and i think the worst part is is like most of them it's it's an ethical choice, right? It's not because they're disgusted by the meat or whatever, but commercial farming, when it comes to even agriculture and, and at livestock, it is gross. It truly is. But I mean, if they had the time to hunt or do that, I think most of them would actually change their mind on the ethical, ethical aspects of it. Yeah. I've had a lot of vegans, um, be very supportive in terms of like hunting, um, your own food it, it's almost like a uh you know well they accept that more than they like the factory farms it's almost more natural it's like i think they realize humans are animals and we do have a place so like we're not truly outside of nature we're within it we've just kind of like made this niche um very specific and very built up and over engineered almost um, <laughs> but like hunting gets you back and fishing gets you back to like you know, semi participating in that like natural cycle. So uh, I think a lot of vegans can be kind of courted in that way um, to not be so critical of hunting or fishing. Yeah. That's, it's kind of funny. I, uh, I interviewed a, a lady that was a vegan and she turned, turned into a hunter and now she even has her own taxidermy oh. shop as well. And, oh, uh, and raises animals on her farm and processes them processes them and and uh she actually she did a ted talk and she was talking about it and the fact if you look at the history of man and you go the length of your arm like commercial agriculture and um like the like commercial livestock you know stockyards and all that kind of stuff is pretty much the tip of your fingernail as far as the length of time that man has been doing that versus actually hunting food and foraging so it's it's definitely interesting to see that you know, and I mean, technically, we're still in experimental stages of food, and and uh, we definitely it's 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 weird to see though that in that short amount of time, I mean, literally a blink of an eye, that we've forgotten all these you know ancestral teachings and all the different things. So that's why it just it truly intrigues me when it comes to the foraging thing. So it's really cool. Right, I definitely feel the connection to deep time because, I mean, humans, um, depending on where you you know, draw that line evolutionarily. But for me, it's with Homo erectus, you know, 2.8 million years ago, um, we're human. We're, we've just become humans through time. Um, so people maybe make a cutoff, like we're not Neanderthals or we're not Denisovans or, um, you know, we're not like Homo heidelbergensis, like all these other humanoid, you know, members of our genus um, that lived and then died leading up to us. Um, the fact that we've been doing, like, we did something for millions of years, and only so recently, people have just totally forgotten it. It's yeah. almost, it is almost a, it, an entirely lost art form. Um, it kind of feels like a rebellion, in a way. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't ever get that. Normally, like. For me, when I talk to people about foraging, if they're totally not into that or just they're like, what are you doing that for? Why, why would you want to do that? You know, like that's the response I get. That's crazy. 
you're going to poison yourself. You know, that's like the typical responses I get. I never get like, oh man, that's so rebellious. <laughs> but right. How many times have, has someone got like went to a restaurant and gotten food poisoning? Like oh, they won't consider, yeah. they don't consider that to be like, like when you go out to a restaurant or you're in the grocery store, you're foraging. It's just, you know, there's a lot of extraneous parts, but that's what you're doing. You're, you're finding a food source on a landscape <laughs> and then you're exploiting it, right? Sure. You're consuming it. So if you go to that shoddy buffet and you eat that, you know, mm, it's a sea- there's seafood and you're like, oh, how long has that been out? And you still eat it. Well, you just made a foraging choice and like <laughs> you made yourself sick. They didn't necessarily make you sick. And so like foragers just, we own up to the fact that we uh, we are the ones choosing our food, you know? And so like, like I said, I've never, um, poison myself and but i have gotten food poisoning at a restaurant so yeah you know which i think we all have right (laughs) yeah yeah right so so with that being said i think that's probably a good good point to um wrap it up and and end this but before we go one more time i'd like you to tell people where they can find you reach out to you take classes all that kind of stuff cool yeah if you are in the upper Midwest, or you plan to be like, if you're going on a trip to the boundary waters, um, and you want to learn about foraging in our area, you can find me at ironwoodforaging.com. Uh, that's my business. Or you can find me in my spicy nature memes at, at MN forager <laughs> on Instagram. Um, yeah. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on and sharing with us. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. You too. once again, thank you so much for listening to the Publicly Challenged podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to. Also, if you could leave a review, that would help us out. And you can check us out on Instagram or at publiclychallenged.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show.